My text this morning is Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. Romans 7, 14 through 25. I'll be reading from that passage in a moment. The interpretation of this text has been the subject of debate for a long time. I myself have gone back and forth on the meaning of these verses several times. I like to say I've had a Romans 7 experience of Romans 7. <laughs> I guess that raises a question whether an unstable person like me should preach on this passage. I, I suppose one thing that comforts me though I'm not putting myself in the same category, is that Augustine himself changed his mind on this passage. When I preach on this text, I'm reminded of J.I. Packer. As a young Christian, Packer was taught that if he let go and let God, he would live a victorious life as a Christian that he would not really struggle with sin. Packer tells us that such teaching almost destroyed him because he was a sensitive and introspective person. I mean, if you know the story, he came across the writings of John Owen, and he says John Owen saved his life because Owen, of Owen's realistic and robust view of the Christian life. At least it saved him psychologically. Well, let's, let's dive in to this text before us. And I am reading from the Christian Standard Bible, Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold as a slave to sin. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one who does it, but it is the sin that lives in me. So I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from the, this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. So how do we describe this text? I think the following descriptions are appropriate. It's autobiographical. It's hard to resist the conclusion that Paul is telling his own story. Robert Gundry says, if Paul is talking about someone else, the description here is melodramatic and incredibly theatrical. It's autobiographical. It's confessional. Paul's vulnerable, isn't he? He's honest about his own struggle. He doesn't, he doesn't hide what's going on in his life. He shares it. And it's agonizing. He can't put into practice what he desires to do. He ends up doing what he hates to do. He finds himself helpless in the war raging in his person. He feels wretched. 
and miserable. Despair and discouragement grip him and hold him fast. Almost all of us as Christians can relate to what Paul says here, but what is the identity of the person talking here? Is this Paul the Christian or Paul the non-Christian? Both views deserve great respect since many skilled and godly interpreters have defended both perspectives in the history of interpretation. So I can hardly claim, I'm not claiming today, I have the last word, I have the definitive word that will resolve this matter forever. I wish I did, but alas, it isn't the case. Still, I'm proposing that the best question to ask, the first question to ask isn't, is this a Christian? or a non-Christian, I think Paul's primary purpose isn't to answer that question. So I'm arguing there's room, test this out, see what you think, there's room to see both believers and unbelievers in this text. His purpose is to show the flesh can't keep God's law. Certainly, unbelievers have no capacity or ability to keep God's law. Paul says in Romans 8, 7, the mindset of the flesh doesn't submit to God's law and cannot keep God's law. As Luther said, there's a bondage of the will. There's slavery to sin. But I'm also suggesting that Romans 7 is part of the story for believers as well. It's not the whole story. It isn't the main story, but it's part of the story. After all, Romans 8 follows Romans 7. The power of the Spirit in our lives frees us from the law of sin and the law of death. So by the power of the Spirit, we're enabled to live a new life, a life that is pleasing to God. I like what Francis Schaeffer said. I quote it all the time. By God's grace, our lives are substantially, significantly, and observably different. We are substantially different. We're not what we were before as believers. We're a new creation now in Jesus Christ. We're significantly different. Our desires have changed. Our our choices have changed. Our actions have changed, and we're observably different. People who knew you before you were a believer will see the difference in your life because you have new attitudes. You have new affections. You have new patterns in your life. Still, I would say that the experience recorded here in Romans 7 It's part of our story as believers because the flesh is still present in us. I don't think Paul's talking here only of immature believers or believers who haven't discovered the secret. I don't think he's saying these are believers who haven't discovered the secret of relying on the Holy Spirit. What Paul talks about here, I think, is part of the experience of all believers, even the most mature believers, even the best Christians, if we can put it that way, until until how long? Until the day we die. So I have I have six reasons. It's gonna be brief. Six reasons to support this view. Five, five applications. Okay? So here we go. Six reasons. First, Paul changes to the present tense in verses 14 through 25. Yes, of course, the present tense doesn't necessarily designate present time. But the shift to the present tense zeroes in on the spiritual capacities of human beings, on their intrinsic weakness and inability. It concentrates on the condition, on the state, on the inherent nature of human beings. Second, Paul underscores the incapacity of the flesh in this text. And we see that in Galatians 5, 16 
through 18. Let's look at that passage just briefly. We see there a battle between the flesh and the Spirit, and that battle continues until the day we die. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want, but if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. When we consider our own capacity, that's a key word for me, you picked that up maybe, when we consider our own capacity as believers, we recognize that in ourselves, we have no ability to do God's will. The fleshiness that Paul describes here isn't a distant memory in our lives. We experience such fleshiness, and I don't mean that we're simply in the body. We, we experience the sin principle in us. We're not entirely free from the sin we inherited in Adam. So as Christians, we often feel in ourselves our wretchedness as human beings. The experience of misery described here lingers until the day of redemption. There are days, right, there, you, you don't look like this looking out at you right now, but there are days as Christians that we hate ourselves and we loathe ourselves because of our sin. I think that's what Paul's talking about here. And I mean the sin that continues in us after our salvation. Third, we need to remember from the previous verses from Romans 7, 7 through 11, that the sin talk Paul talks about here is covening. Paul's not talking about murder here. He's not talking about stealing. He's not talking about adultery. He zeroes in on the desires of the heart. We're reminded of the words of Jesus. Anger, anger in the heart is like murder, is equivalent to murder. Lust in the heart violates the prohibition against adultery. Paul doesn't focus on wild and extravagant displays of sin. Just parenthetically, there are some people nowadays arguing that, that that's what this passage is about. But it's the word coveting. We don't have wild and extravagant displays of sin here. But the sins that lurk in the inner person, we recognize in ourselves lust, anger, bitterness, resentment, jealousy. They're not absent. If we say we're entirely free from those things, we're either lying or, or you don't know yourself very well. No wonder Jesus taught us that we should regularly pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. When Augustine deba debated Pelagius about perfectionism, he again and again returned to that verse in the Lord's Prayer. He said, obviously we're not perfect because the Lord taught us to regularly pray the Lord's Prayer, which is a good word for us if you don't regularly pray that prayer. As Protestants, sometimes we forget to pray the prayer regularly that Jesus taught us. Let me add here, there's no, there's no excuses here for sin. Paul's not excusing his sin here, is he? That's not what's going on. Paul's not, Paul's not taking sin lightly here. He isn't pursuing sin and saying, oh, it's all right. He hates it. He hates it. He feels wretched because of it. Fourth, what I've just said fits with Romans 7.22. Paul delights in God's law in the inner person. You know, some people think that Paul's talking about what we see in Romans 10, where we see that the Jews have a zeal for the law. But I don't think it's the same. I don't think it's the same because here Paul talks about an inner delight for what is good, and yet he's frustrated by the failure to do what is right. As I said before, bears 
repeating. This isn't the whole story of our lives. We, we do live new lives by the power of the Spirit, but failure is part of the story of our lives, and it keeps us humble. As long as we live, we realize we need forgiveness. As Dr. Muller read Psalm 51 today, what an appropriate passage. If we forget this about ourselves, we become, as Christians, self-righteous. We lose the softness and the tenderness before God that He wants us to have. There's a realism here, right, that guards us from, from perfectionism and from a false kind of piety that claims we're more godly than we are. If we deny the continuing reality of sin in our lives, we're in danger of becoming like the Pharisees. And that can show up with other people if we become proud and rigid and unteachable and unloving. How can that happen? If we begin, if we begin to rationalize, rationalize and explain away the sin that is in our lives. If we begin to deny it, yes, yes, the opposite can happen, right? We can concentrate on our our sin and forget that we are new in Christ. If you're sensitive and introspective, you can overhear one dimension of the scriptural witness, and, and you can destroy yourself. I know that. Scripture knows that. God knows that. You can destroy yourself with an overzealous conscience. We're reminded every passage we read, it always takes spiritual wisdom to understand and apply the scriptures. It isn't, it isn't just a matter of interpreting one passage, is it? It's always a matter of thinking of the whole canonical witness. So you, so you could take my message in a wrong way today, especially if you're sensitive and introspective. Fifth, Another indication that Christians continue to struggle with the flesh is verse 24, where Paul says, who will rescue me from this body of death? I think that is a very crucial verse in this discussion. Yes, the very next phrase, we have glad thanksgiving to God through Jesus Christ for our deliverance. But I think we have an already not yet here as well. We're free, but we don't have complete freedom until the day of resurrection. Notice what he says here. Who will will rescue me from the body, the body of this death? That's a future tense verb. We live in the body, this body, our mortal bodies, our bodies that are dying until the day of our redemption. And then we'll get new bodies, incorruptible bodies, immortal bodies. But as long as we're in this mortal body, sin remains in us. Not because our bodies are intrinsically sinful, but it's who we are in Adam. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. It's not just in Romans 7, by the way. Look at Romans 8, verse 10. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. So we see even in this verse the tension and the awkwardness of what it means to be a Christian. We're new in Christ, and yet sin continues to exist in us as long as we inhabit our mortal bodies. Romans 8, 23, not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So, we, on the one hand, we have the Spirit who strengthens us and comforts us. On the other hand, our, we groan. Our bodies are wearing out, and there's the continuing presence of sin in us. Sixth, lastly, the chapter doesn't conclude on a note of victory, but a note of tension and ambiguity. 
Verse 25, 25b. So then with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Paul reminds us our fleshly nature doesn't vanish when we become believers. The struggle continues. We may be Dr. Jekyll during the day, but Mr. Hyde during the night. So let's think quickly of just five applications of this text. First, there's a danger of underestimating what the Holy Spirit can do in us and what He is doing in us, as I said before. But there's also a danger of overestimating the change that has occurred in us. We should not be surprised by the battle with sin that rages in us. We shouldn't be surprised by the struggle that we experience as Christians. There's never a good excuse for sin. No excuses. But we shouldn't be surprised by the sin in our lives and the fact that we suffer defeats. Our fleshiness continues until the day of our redemption. Your desire to sin isn't different from other believers. And such desires to sin, they don't mean you're not a Christian. Every Christian, at least every Christian who is honest, has that struggle. It can be simplistic, therefore, to say to a person, remember what I said, no excuses, but it can be simplistic to say to a person when we're counseling with them, identify the sin, just stop it, right? So, Paul knows he's sinning here and he hates it and he's still doing it. No, no excuses, but it's too simplistic just to say, just stop doing that on some occasions. Second, we're reminded, as I already mentioned, of the need to continue to confess our sin. We must beware of becoming hardened to the sin that is still in us. You know, it gets tiring to keep confessing our sins. So let's not stifle the voice of God's Spirit as He points out sin in us. And the Spirit often uses others to do that for us. So my wife loves me, but more than anybody else in my life, God has used her to point out sin in my life. <laughs> I praise God for that. That's been good for me. And he uses others as well. So let's ask God to keep us honest and humble so that we don't become hardened and proud. We could produce a community that's false where we try to appear more righteous than we really are. Remember, I'm talking about covenant, not wild, extravagant displays of sin. Third, if we recognize the continuing sin in our own lives, then we'll be much quicker to love others when we see sin in their lives. Living with other people, even other saved people, it can be off-putting. Paul says, bear with other people. Why does he say that? Because sometimes they're hard to bear with. When I was a young Christian, one of my favorite pastors was Ray Steadman. I only met him a couple times, but I read lots of his sermons. He was the famous pastor of Peninsula Bible Church in Palo Alto, California. He used to say this little poem. I think he borrowed it from someone else, but I thought it was a helpful little jingle. To live above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. To live below with the saints we know, well, that's a different story. <laughs> so, how true. The longer I've been a Christian, the more I see sin, not just in me, but also in others. We have that experience as we live. We see the flaws in others, and sometimes those flaws are annoying to us. We can say to ourselves, 
Don't they see that sin in their lives? Well, maybe they do, or maybe they don't. But even if they see the problem, they may still be struggling to overcome it, and we can help them, but we're still called upon to love them. We're called upon to overlook the faults of others and to love them anyway. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 12 says, love covers all offenses, not most offenses, but all offenses. Of course, there's times for reproof, right? There's times for church discipline. But there are many times, many times to overlook the sins of others. There have been a number of times in my life when I've almost reproved someone and I didn't. Now, it's been the opposite too, but there have been many times I've almost reproved someone and then I didn't. And I look back and said, I was so right not to do that. (laughs) I was so right not to speak on that occasion. Sometimes the path of wisdom is to overlook. Is there someone you're refusing to love? Does a brother or sister in Christ come to mind right now who annoys you? If so, have you forgotten your own sin? Has your heart become hard against a brother or sister who has hurt you? We linger in God's presence and we remember His great forgiving love toward us. Part of what it means to be in a seminary community is to exercise critical judgment. That's part of theological wisdom and spiritual maturity. God doesn't want us to be children who are naive and gullible. But the danger is a critical, unloving spirit can invade our lives. Do we scan others for faults, mainly, or for things to praise in them? Do we look at others and say, what's good in them that I can imitate, or do we look for what's negative? I remember years ago going into a scholar's office, and he was absolutely brilliant. This was in another state and another time. Don't try to figure out who this is. We start talking about various books. Every book I named, I was a young student. Every book I named, he said, terrible, terrible. I start thinking about the paper I was going to do for him. (laughs) Terrible, terrible. So maybe, maybe they were all terrible. Maybe they were. I don't know. But there's, there can be a spirit of criticism and judgmentalism that begins to take over our lives and we confuse it for being spiritually mature. Fourth, I've really already said this, but I just want to hit it from another angle. We learned something about the church from this text. The church is the new creation. The church is the new people of God. But when we join the church, we throw in our lot with people who are flawed and broken. I I tend to be a bit naive and gullible, but... You know, I've had this experience of joining a new church. I know it's wrong, but when I join a new church, I've had this experience and I'm there and I think, these people are practically perfect at the beginning, right? (laughs) This place, people love each other so much and it's true. They are amazing people and they are transformed by God's grace. But after a while, if you hang around, you begin to see the cracks in the foundation, right? I, I, I begin to see, oh, There's tension between those two people. I never saw that before, but now I see it. And then then you begin to see, oh, some people have a hard time loving one another. We're reminded as the church, we're being transformed, but we're a community of sinners as well. We're being transformed by God's grace, and that text helps us understand church history. We understand not just their own lives, but we understand the Christians that preceded us. They may have done amazing things, but they've done some terrible things too. Martin Luther, amazing. God used him, but the things he said about the Jews, they're embarrassing. Martin Luther was saved by grace alone, right? As all of us were, are. Finally, God could have perfected us immediately when we are saved. But he didn't choose to do so. 
as we live as disciples of Christ, we see our own sin more clearly. The older I get, the more I see. God gives me glimpses. I'm sure I don't see the whole, but I see more and more how self-absorbed and selfish I am. Sometimes people tell me, no, you're not, but I, I know myself. I think that's true of all of us. Why do we have such a struggle with sin after we're saved? I think the Lord wants us to see how great our sin is so that we understand how great our salvation is. We understand how great His love is for us. He sees all our sin, but He wants us to experience it and feel it so that we give ourselves to God in Jesus Christ. We rejoice in the great deliverance we have, and we're confident because He's saved us and loved us that He will transform us fully on the last day. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that the Scriptures speak to every area of our lives. And we thank You that You love us even though we still struggle and battle with sin. Help us not to use a message like this to make any excuses for our sins. Help us to be honest and confess our sins and not hide the sins in our lives. But help us also to rejoice that we are your children, sinners though we are, and that we stand perfect in the righteousness of Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I, I just want to do this. Uh, I always learn, Dr. Schreiner, when you teach. Uh, but I think it might be helpful for this whole community to know some conversations begin and seemingly never end. Why, why did you choose this text today? I, I guess I don't need that. I chose it because I revised, I, I just finished revising my Romans commentary. Yes. And um, in the process, I changed my mind on Romans 7 again. <laughs> yeah. okay. so. You just have to understand what sheer delight there is yeah. in this moment for me <laughs> at, in every way conceivable so. because 21 years ago when Dr. Schreiner I'm going to take you into a place, most of you in this room were not, but I was, and I was chairing the, uh, the faculty search meeting, the faculty interview for Dr. Tom Schreiner, and 21 years ago, before some of you in this room were, <laughs> in the midst of the moment when other faculty get to ask prospective new faculty questions. Dr. Tom, I, and the fact that I remember this 21 years later tells you something, but Dr. Tom Nettles asked Dr. Tom Schreiner how he interpreted these very verses from Romans chapter 7. And I, I just want to see if our memories collide here and coincide here. There may be either one. <laughs> but as I recall, you set out an entire explanation different than the one today. And then you said, but I'm not sure. Right. Is that right? That's right. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, I'm just thankful 21 years later, you've returned to this passage. Why do I say this? It's because world-class New Testament scholar who lives before us an incredible intellectual honesty of struggling with the biblical text uh, even as Paul's. So I just want to tell you, I love you. I thank you for that text. I just, I just, when you said turn to Romans chapter 7, I thought, my goodness, I'm back in the faculty interview 21 years ago. <laughs> and uh, if only Tom Nettles had been here this morning to see it.